on, I'm going to be presenting about the rich recorded sound collections out there, both in the Library of Congress and as well as in other institutions. So I, just to get us in the mood, I'd like to play a sample from a recent acquisition of the American Folklife Center, um, the Michael Alpert Collection. Um, and the performance is from 1987 by a uh, Ukrainian whoops, um, <laughs> violinist named Leon Schwartz. Um, and it's got a bit of an introduction in kind of English and Yiddish. Some call them Batchen, some call them Marshall. The thing is that we used to like very much that when there was one. Because he used to, a shiny model to funky spiel, it was a person called. interested in the topic of Yiddish collections because of a personal connection. Um, my mother is from Israel and grew up during a time when the Yiddish language and culture of her parents was rejected in favor of the Hebrew language. And when I was growing up, I don't think I quite realized this and how hard it must have been to think about the language and culture that my grandparents left behind um, and which was tied up in the family that they lost in the Holocaust. And through listening to and learning about these songs and stories, I'm now discovering the rich culture that is my heritage. So why are Yiddish recorded sound collections um, of interest? They provide insight into the language and culture that Jew Eastern European Jews developed over hundreds of years and that they brought with them when they immigrated to the US in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, much of the language and culture was lost during the Holocaust. Um, in Poland alone, 3 million of the 3.3 million Yiddish speakers, Yiddish speaking Jews were murdered um, to give a sense of the scale of the loss of culture. And given this loss, it's incredible that there's still a significant body of recordings available to us today. And the songs and stories allow us to hear many of the struggles Jews faced during and, and um, in the aftermath of World War II. Um, the challenges of assimilation in the US, as well as much evidence of just the joys of life. Though there are far few Yiddish, fewer Yiddish speakers today than in the early 1900s, in the last five to 10 years, there's been somewhat of a resurgence of interest in learning the language and in performing songs and um, in theater in Yiddish itself. Um, festivals and camps such as Klez Canada and the Yiddish New York Festival, which I had the opportunity to attend last uh, Christmas, um, involve young people and are devoted to advancing contem contemporary Yiddish culture, music, and scholarship. So why do a survey of Yiddish collections? Um, this presentation identifies the existing Yiddish collections and how they differ in terms of subject areas, time periods, and geographic areas. Doing a survey will allow institutions and scholars to identify the range of resources available to them, to identify what still needs to be collected, and to surface more unknown collection, collections, and uh, will also allow for more in-depth and focused research. And also having primary source recordings can help with reinterpretations of the music and theater. So in this presentation, I'll give an overview of the major Yiddish recorded sound collections, and in describing each, I'll point out specific content areas and strengths, as well as levels of accessibility. Um, then I'll describe uh, collection, overlapping collections between the American Folklife Center, I might say AFC, um, and other institutions. And, um, and then finally, I'll go into the Yiddish collections that are unique to the Library of Congress, emphasizing the existing uh, collections at the American Folklife Center, as well as what's coming on the horizon in terms of finding aids, digitization, and access. So I'm going to stay on this slide for a minute. Um, 
Uh, so this is a list, this list is uh, what I've identified as the major recorded sound collections that have significant audio materials, saving the bolded ones for last, and I'll go into more depth on those. Um, all these collections share several qualities. Uh, they often include many recordings, sometimes over, th over thousand, um, that cover a range of content um, from religious to secular, um, and folk songs and instrumental songs, um, as well as songs from shtetls um, of Europe. They all have some degree of accessibility, um, and the collections are often searchable and indexed in various ways. Um, and now I'll point out some distinctive qualities of each. So the Milken Archive of Jewish Music is the largest collection of American Jewish music, and it's notable for its themed volumes of recordings that are commercial, commercially available on CDs and digitally. Accompanying each of their curated volumes is an in-depth essay about the musical theme or genre. Um, they've produced a 50-volume set on the Naxos label that reflects uh, the range of their holdings from, it's all over the map, from symphonic music to jazz to music for Jewish holidays. The Yiddish Book Center, in addition to amassing one million Yiddish books and working to regenerate Yiddish uh, music and uh, literature and culture, um, is notable for its audio archive of lectures by and interviews with writers and poets who visited the Jewish Public Library of Montreal between 1953 and 2005. Um, so the Jewish Public Library was uh, a place where refugees and survivors um, from Eastern Europe um, would gather, and it became an actual center for Yiddish literature and culture. And the recordings allow us to hear their um, what these cultural figures sounded like um, from their dialects and cadences. Um, you can hear the wit that they use in the language and inflections that are only able to be expressed through speaking the language itself. Um, the archive provides online and downloadable access to, um, to these uh, 300, um, and now I can't remember the number, but um, to these talks by notable U uh, J uh, Jewish writers such as um, Isaac Besheva Singer, Saul Bellow, and Ellie Wiesel. Uh, the Molly and, uh, Robert and Molly Friedman Jewish Music Archive at the University of Pennsylvania is striking because of its database. Um, it's got 25,000 entries that make it possible to search by song titles, composers, performers, um, and to compare different versions of songs and to also discover unknown songs um, of and spoken word from 20th century Jewish life. Uh, Florida Atlantic University Jewish Sound Archive um, is a central repository for mostly commercial uh, Jewish music, which was gathered from around the world as part of the Judaica Music Rescue Project. Uh, many of the recordings are digitized and available on the FAU website. Uh, the Fairer Jewish uh, Music Center at the Museum of the Jewish Diaspora at Tel Aviv University uh, preserves and promotes Jewish music, including a lot of Yiddish music, um, from the museums uh, for the museum's visitors. So it's more of an experience when you're there um, through interactive exhibits um, that allow patrons to browse through databases and listen to Jewish music from various communities. Uh, the National. Uh, National Sound Archives at the National Library of Israel also has a huge collection of both commercial and archival uh, folk music, um, and they estimate their Yiddish collections to be about 1,800 hours. Uh, many tracks are streamable at the item level through their catalog records. Um, so now, yeah, I'm going to go into depth on these last three. Um, so the Mayrent collection of Yiddish recordings housed at um, Mills Music Library at the University of Wisconsin was the brainchild of Sherry Mayrent, um, who is a scholar, klezmer musician, composer, and record producer. So Mayrent realized that there were missing generations of people to learn songs from, both due to assimilation um, after immigration and also because of the Holocaust. And in order to help fill that gap of material, she amassed over 9,078s, including rare Yiddish recordings from the Soviet Union, South America, South Africa, Europe, and Israel. 
The Mayrant collection is tremendous, both in its breadth of Yiddish commercial recordings from early to mid 20th centuries, um, and also in its level of access. From its in-depth catalog records with their titles in their original languages, along with accompanying translations and transliterations. Um, Jeanette Casey, the Mills uh, Music Library head, alerted me that with the help of Sherry Mayrent, who's here, by the way, um, that nearly, um, they've completed all the label scans, nearly a digitization of nearly all the audio files, and um, almost all the transliteration and translation work. They're also working to turn their metadata into MARC uh, catalog fields to help create or enhance catalog records for WorldCat. And yeah, just uh, the example of Sherry Mayrent um, accumulating this collection can serve as a model for other um, collections of um, developing other collections of ethnic um, 78s. Um, the Mayrent collection also holds 11 of the cylinders that were inducted into this year's recorded sound registry as the earliest known recordings of Yiddish songs dating from 1901 to 1905. And these are some of the first ethnically focused commercial releases. Uh, the Dartmouth Jewish Sound Archive provides online streaming access to over 50,000 tracks of Yiddish and Jewish music and spoken word. And many of the recordings are unique and not commercially available. Uh, the archive is notable because of its collaboration with the Jewish Music Research Center of the Hebrew University, which allows them to both share biographical, musicological, and sociological metadata and, and to enhance their descriptions of the recordings, um, which greatly increases people's understanding of the material. Uh, record covers and liner notes have been scanned, as well as labels, jackets, and details about the recordings, and they're notated, all, all notated in the database. The Max and Frida Weinstein Archive of Sound Recordings is unique because um, it's connected to the YIVO Institute, which is the largest and most comprehensive collection of materials on Eastern, Eastern European Jewish civilization. It was founded in 1925 in Vilna. It was looted by the Nazis, but some, some material survived, and it's been headquartered in New York City since 1940. The Weinstein Archive houses over 15,000 recordings and includes music and spoken word recordings covering Yiddish and Hebrew folk music, Holocaust songs, klezmer music, liturgical music, and field recordings, to name a few. Um, now I'd like to talk about the collections that overlap between the American Folklife Center and other institutions. And um, focusing on the Ruth Rubin and the Ben Stonehill collections, which are both major collections of Yiddish field recordings, for which AFC received the collection, and other institutions either received copies or related original content. And these include US Holocaust Memorial Museum, the National Library of Israel, and the YIVO Institute. Uh, Ruth Rubin was a singer and folklorist who devoted her life's work to collecting, performing, and preserving East European um, folk songs. She had several of her own releases on, on folkways, um, both of her singing and of her collections of uh, field recordings of Yiddish songs um, that included transcriptions and translations. Um, yeah. Ju uh, Ruth Rubin's collection of over 1,900 songs from about uh, 1946 through the 1970s cover a wide variety of content. They include um, Yiddish ballads, Hasidic songs, anti-Hasidic songs, World War II songs, <laughs> labor songs, and in addition to lighter songs like drinking songs, dancing songs, um, and children's songs. Um, YIVO has created a tremendous online resource called the Ruth Rubin Legacy that makes uh, Rubin's archive available for streaming and research. Um, so this online, this great online resource documents the post-war experience through songs and stories. And it's also become a valuable resource for musicians looking for unique Yiddish songs and repertoire. 
It's also a great example of an organization making an American Folklife Center collection accessible. And our archive actually encourages that. We often don't have enough technical support to put collections online that we'd like to. And at YIVO, they have more expertise on Yiddish subjects, which they were able to use to enrich the metadata for the online presentation. Uh, another shared collection with other institutions is the Ben Stonehill collection. Uh, the collection captures the experience of Jewish displaced persons after World War II in, in 1948 at a moment when refugees were still longing for their homes um, while also adjusting to being in America. Ben Stonehill was a Jewish immigrant from Poland who was devoted to, Jewish, to preserving Jewish and Yiddish culture and was a collector of songs. He learned that recently arrived Jewish DPs, displaced persons, were being temporarily housed at the Hotel Marseille in Upper Manhattan. Um, this prompted him to, buy, to borrow a wire recorder uh, from the electronic equipment store that he, worked, um, that he worked at and to haul it by subway from Queens to the Upper West Side in order to record the songs and stories of these survivors nearly every weekend that year. Um, Stonehill collected over a thousand songs and stories and these reflect the emotional condition of these newly arrived refugees um, and show their resilience and also the healing power of connecting with each other through song. Uh, so Stonehill donated his collection to the American Folklife Center and he personally supervised the wire recordings transferred to tape before his premature death in 1964. Uh, since then, the collection has been digitized. Um, when the Holocaust Museum acquired the collection in 2006, Brett Werb, the recorded sound curator, enlisted the help of Yiddish scholar and fellow at the Holocaust Museum, Miriam Isaacs, to sort through the nearly 40 hours of recorded sound. She curated, translated, transliterated, and categorized hundreds uh, of the songs from the collection, and they're streamable through the Stonehill Jewish Song Archive webpage. I've got the URL there, but you can ask me if you want it um, later. So there are a range of collections, of audio collections that are unique to the Library of Congress that provide insight into Yiddish culture. The recorded sound section has preserved and made accessible 72 sides of 78s um, through the National Jukebox Project. And more 78s will be added through the library's collaboration with the Mayrent Collection at Wisconsin. Um, these ethnic recordings offer a different kind of insight into the popular music and ethnic characterizations of the time than do the, these collections of field recordings that we just spoke about. Um, and in addition, or at the American Folklife Center, in addition to uh, Yiddish materials and smaller collections, um, there's also a few major Yiddish collections in AFC archives. Um, the ones I'd like to point out are the Aaron Ziegelman collection, the Henry Sposnick collection, and the recently acquired Michael Albert collection. Uh, the Ziegelman Foundation collection documents life in a shtetl in Poland, um, Lubomol it was called, um, whose Jewish community was destroyed in World War II. And it's uh, through oral histories with family members uh, of people uh, from the shtetl. And these were conducted from 1994 to 2000. And it's got a company, it, it accompanies, accompanied with the collection are a lot of photographs and manuscripts. I'm going to focus more on the Sapoznik and, um, and Michael Alpert. So the Henry Sapoznik collection is extremely unique um, collection of Yiddish radio from the, from the 1930s until the 1950s. And it provides a more localized perspective on Yiddish immigrant culture in the United States. Henry Sapoznik, a klezmer musician, historian, composer, and producer, uh, literally stumbled upon a pile of 16-inch aluminum discs in uh, a New York City storage room. And these 100 discs started the collection and inspired him to collect more, amassing the largest collection of Yiddish radio in the world. Oh, actually, I meant to stay there. Um, 
So in New York City alone, there were 30 radio stations that aired Jewish programming during the late 30s through the early 1950s. And these ranged from advice shows, variety shows, man on the street interviews, news, music, drama shows um, in both Yiddish and English. The programs in this collection give us a, a very intimate window into American Jewish life and show the collision of Yiddish and American cultures, um, also the realities of the dawning Holocaust and the day-to-day -day lives of immigrants struggling to make it in a new land. Uh, the Saposit collection includes all of the recordings that were gathered and became part of the Yiddish radio project, a project from the early 2000s that featured radio documentary, documentaries from Saposnik's collection that were curated, translated, acted out, and broadcast as a series on NPR's All Things Considered. Um, so a lot in the collection that we got from Saposnik, uh, he supplied us, along with the recordings, he supplied us with rich descriptions of each program, um, program type, uh, and included other information about sponsors, of the shows, dates, and various other fields which have been integrated into a collection finding aid by uh, Folk Life Center archivist Marcia Siegel, and that should be going online in June. Um, so here's a sample from the Yiddish Radio Project uh, from the episode about pl Yiddish playwright and, and actor Nahum Stuchkov, who wrote intensely emotional dramas, uh, radio dramas. Um, his radio uh, plays portrayed a different fictional Jewish family, uh, di a different family struggling to adapt to life in America. And he also wrote and acted in commercials for, for matzah, um, which were well loved by listeners. So this is from the program Saposnik produced for NPR. And so it's uh, interspersed with uh, translations, and it's also uh, got his son speaking, the actor's son. Come on, Today, go. my father is totally forgotten. Sixty years ago, he was beloved by New York's immigrant Jewish community. His dramas were hugely popular, his writing revered. <laughs> Listeners would tune in each week just to hear his matzah commercials. When you take a piece of Manischewitz matzah in your hand, you know you're holding something well-made, beautiful, clear, light, with a thousand tastes. Remember, this is matzah my dad's talking about. It's just flour and water and a little bit of salt. When you hear the word silver, what comes to mind? Sterling. When you hear the word the word matzah, what comes to mind? Future historians who will study the economic enterprises of American Jews will no doubt give a separate place of honor to the B. Manischewitz Matzah Company. Jews know this, and when Jews desire the best matzah, they know what to ask for. They say, give me Manischewitz. A uh, recent acquisition for the American Folklife Center is the Michael Alpert Collection, which documents East European-born Yiddish musicians and singers. Um, so Michael Alpert is a multi-instrumentalist, uh, singer, composer, dancer, knows multiple languages, and he was a 2015 NEA National Heritage Fellow. Uh, while living in New York and LA, uh, he, and traveling around Europe, um, as a touring klezmer musician, Alpert recorded these Yid Yiddish performers and musical masters who had greatly influenced his own music. That's Michael Alpert. And the recordings he made are of interviews, conversations, rehearsals, and performances with these musicians. Alpert often accompanied the performers on fiddle and was able to speak to them in Yiddish. Uh, so the center, uh, for traditional music and dance has uh, mostly digitized the collection. And Albert and Alpert and his intern have been working on amassing a spreadsheet that includes many details and descriptions about each recording. Um, and that's gonna be incorporated into the collection's finding aid. So from learning about all of these 
Yiddish collections around the world, it's clear that there's a massive amount of material out there, from songs to dramas to oral histories to radio broadcasts. So what are some, some of the uses of these rich collections of Yiddish recordings? People can study how Yiddish music evolved from its East European origins to the US and how it affected commercial American music, especially the many Jewish composers on Tin Pan Alley. As Jews became part of the fabric of American culture, how did the music itself evolve as well as the themes of the music? How's the topic of, of assimilation into broader American culture changed over time? And the spoken word recordings also provide important insight into Jewish responses to the Holocaust, either as survivors or as immigrants before the war. Telling their stories in Yiddish allowed them to fully express their stories in their native language and one that's bound up in a Jewish experience. And the music and spoken word recordings are extremely important for continued interest in learning the Yiddish language and in performing its songs in theater. And this interest can breathe new life into the language and culture. So I encourage you to go out and listen and enjoy this uh, music and culture, ex cultural experience. Um, and to, I'm going back here. Um, so I wanted to just leave you with some more music to close out. Uh, we heard at the beginning of the presentation uh, one of the musicians from the, Mike, from the Michael Alpert collection, but I wanted to play another example uh, from Leon Schwartz's playing. And um, so it's Leon playing fiddle and Michael on second fiddle and Jerry Kisslinger on bass. And this was recorded at Leon's home in Queens. Um, and it is a freilich, which is a dance tune traditionally played at a wedding. So thanks very much. Um. So this is a given to get spilled for the for the for the marathon. But then he had spilled a freilich, a freilich, a freilich. But the grief was freilich. Said a freilich as long as it was something that it was some pump 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 very much. All right, any questions from Maya, Tim? A very uh, interesting presentation. Uh, I'm most familiar, familiar with the Dartmouth uh, archive, and I know in that case uh, a fairly uh, shall we say, understanding legal department of the college uh, gave them permission, the two professors who run that, to make uh, materials available online with a restriction that you have to let them know in advance or yeah. apply to them, actually, uh, explaining what your use is uh, going right. to be before you can then be authorized to, to access online. My question to you is, of all of the collections uh, you were talking about, um, how many are available online, and are there restrictions like that commonly? Um, yeah, I was going to mention that restriction, but I was trying to cut my presentation down <laughs> to be shorter. Um, yeah, and I, I actually did that. I requested permission to, and I didn't really know what to write. I just said I want to use, I don't think I said I worked at the Library of Congress. I just said I wanted to use it for educational reasons, and the next day it was granted access. Um, so that was pretty easy. Uh, I just want to see... So, 
Yeah, Yiddish Book Center, they're completely downloadable. And um, yeah, so you can stream and download them for free. It's amazing. Uh, the Milken Archive, those are commercial. So it's, yeah, so it's you have to pay, but they're, um, you can buy them. Um, either download or get CDs. Um, the, yeah, so the one at Tel Aviv University, no. Um, that's not available online. I think you have to be at the museum but there's um, access on site. Uh, National, Library of, National Library of Israel, a lot. I don't remember what the percentage is, but in their catalog records, often they link to digital files um, at the item level. Um, yeah, May Rent is extremely um, accessible. It's not downloadable, it's streaming access, right? Yeah, and, um, and then I missed, yeah, Florida, I, I think the, Penn, UPenn, and Florida are, um, there's like a portion that's accessible online, but I'm not sure. So it sounds like uh, maybe a, mi a minority of these are available to a scholar online. Uh, is that fair? Um, Some are, but, but many aren't. Yeah, it's a I would say it's a percentage of, yeah. Is of there any move to change that in our changing world of scholarship and access? Um, you know, I don't know. I don't work at these places, but um, yeah, I think yeah. I mean, Yiddish Book Center is it's completely accessible, um, and Dartmouth is pretty. Yeah, I think I think it's more accessible than not accessible, and I'm sure. That, yeah, I have a feeling that they're trying to make it more accessible, but I don't. I can't really speak to to them. I can speak to our recordings, and. Um, we're, yeah, we're moving to try to make them more accessible. I'm not sure if they'll be online, but um, we're trying to get um, at least access to files from, um, yeah, on demand. Oh. Uh, just to clarify, on for the uh, Florida, uh, uh, they actually, anyone can visit that site and get 45 seconds of their recordings. And then what you would do is, if you, as a researcher, apply for a researcher status, you get full access to the tracks. Um, and, so, and that's really, that's a free service. You know, you just go in and make the request. Uh, they also will, um, if you ask them, uh, if there's a record that they have not streamed yet, they will as quickly as possible. Usually, I get it within two to four weeks. I'll have that that record will be available to me. Thank you. I didn't know that. Thank you so much. Just so you're aware, there's also a collector up in uh, Buffalo, New York, who also does presentations. But he's done a lot of collection in this type of area with player piano rolls. His name is Bob Berkman, and he also does programs and things. He did a program at the 2018 Reaction to the Record at Stanford. So it's just another oh, source. Oh, great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm sure I, I might have missed some major collections also. This is just what I, yeah. Uh, just to follow up on the question here about yes, access, please. the May Rent collection yeah. at University of Wisconsin in Madison. So we're hoping in the next year to get all of the tracks up uh, streaming, and we're in discussion with um, other places to have our material um, link back to our audio so that it you can come across it in the Digital Public Library of America, for example, and uh, potentially Europeana, maybe the National Jukebox, because um, one thing that our collector or donor, Sherry Mayrant, wanted was to have this material as accessible as possible. Um, so that's one thing we've really been trying to honor. Uh, and with the Internet Archives Great 78 project, um, well, our legal counsel is comfortable with streaming, downloads not so much, but we are seriously considering just giving our files to the Internet Archive and then they would be accessible also through a download. Great, thank you. And while we're plugging things, um, yeah. 
The Archives of Traditional Music also has the archives of Yiddish historical and ethnographic memories, which has many, many um, video recordings of oral histories and narratives with um, Yiddish persons in Eastern Europe. Yeah, okay. I just learned about that since talking to Allison here at ARSC. <laughs> A uh, quick question. I'm I'm not an expert in Jewish or Yiddish uh, culture, but assuming that uh, it is rather a global uh, a global thing, right? So because of the diaspora, the the, the Jews were spread uh, uh, across the globe. And I see, of course, a lot of uh, American US, US American archives, some uh, from Israel. Uh, did you or are you planning to reach out also to other museums? For example, I for a fact know there's the, the Jewish Museum in Vienna from which I suppose they also have uh, some material there, so. Um, yeah, do, I would where love do, to. Where do you stop? Because this is a global, this is a global. <laughs> yeah, uh, my, global my boss was making fun of me. She's like, did you finish your national survey of, or international survey of Yiddish collections? So no, I didn't, you know, I, I was only focusing, I was primarily focusing on the US, um, but I would, I would like to know more about the international collections and potentially, yeah, do a research project, write a paper. Okay. But I haven't done that yet. We are at time, but lucky for everyone, this is now break, so I'm sure our presenters will be willing to answer more questions during the break time. Um, but I would like to, for everyone to give another round of applause to our wonderful presenters for this session. Thank you.